morning. I'll tell you what, I've been preaching at a few churches while I've been studying under Mike, and including Santa Clara Church of Christ. This church is the one that's leading the most songs during service. What they don't have, though, is a platform that's about 20 feet high off the ground. It's all up here. My name is Tad and yes, I do have a difficult name to pronounce. Uh, oftentimes, my dad actually apologizes to me for giving me a name that uh, takes longer to try to figure out how to say after I've ordered food and they're trying to call out my name than it did to prepare the food. I get a lot of Taylors, I get a lot of Talones, I get a lot of Trevors, I get, I get a, sometimes even a Michael if it's real muffled. I'm happy to be there here with you this morning though. So if you wanna jump over to the book of Luke, we're gonna be in Luke chapter nine this morning and we're gonna look at the transfiguration, the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Next week, next Sunday, is when we're going to celebrate Easter. Whether that happened on the day that we celebrated or not is a little relevant, but it's a, it's a wonderful time that we actually get to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is a time when, when we don't suddenly start coming into the church. Beautiful Easter world you know what i think i have somewhere to be it's usually sir chris and and some of those people really actually dedicate a title to themselves they call them ceo christians christmas easter only christians so as we're getting ready for next week to remember the resurrection something so crucial to our faith this morning we're going to look at just a glimpse that jesus gives us of his glory right here on this in chapter 9. Thank you for reading that this morning, by the way. So in Luke chapter 9, if we just back up before the transfiguration just a little bit, we have the confession of Peter that Jesus Christ is the Lord. In Luke chapter 9, verse 18, it says this, Now it happened that as he was praying alone, that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. The other answered, Elijah. And others said, maybe one of the prophets of old that have risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, Christ of God. And he strictly charged them. He commanded them, telling that no one should say, because the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. What an interesting thing to hear just after you've, you've the one you've been waiting for is finally here, the Christ. And all of a sudden he's telling you, yes, but I'm also the one that has to be rejected. I'm also the one that's going to die. But on the third day, I'll be raised. This was exactly the king that you're expecting. Expect for so long, the Messiah, so long, the deliverer is finally here. And he tells you, but I still have to die. I still have to re be rejected. I have to suffer many things. I can imagine since the disciples are humans, just like you and I, flesh and blood, that they were probably a little bit confused at what they had just heard. And so just eight days later, we have verse 28. Eight days later. In the other, in the other Gospels, it says either a few days or, or seven days later. You kind of have that weird delay of a difference. Or six days, I think it says. Six days a week or eight days. So somewhere, depending on when you want to start this timeline, Luke says it was eight days later. He gives you a time. Eight days later, he took Peter, James, John, and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with them, they were heavy asleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. They saw his glory. 
few people actually get to witness the glory of God. Jesus Christ is giving just a glimpse of who he is on this mountaintop. He's peeling back the veil just to reveal a little bit of his glory. This is who Jesus Christ actually is. This is where he actually came from. If you also look over in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, you see this. This is what's written about him. Hebrews chapter 1, and starting in verse 2, it says this, But in the last days he has spoke to us by Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become high as much superior to the angels and more excellent than all the heirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This is who Jesus is actually is. And as we're on a mountaintop, this is a peak, just a peak of his glory, what will be revealed after the resurrection. But many a thing still have to come. Not only is he there, but you have Moses and Elijah, two great men that haven't existed for a long, long time. You have Moses, one that went up to the mountain also to speak with God. Elijah, one who was also on the mountain to speak with God. And we have three, three individuals that are now on the mountain with these three other great men that witness just something that very few get to behold on a mountain. Moses is there, the one who is given the law. Elijah is there, one of the many great prophets. You have the conclusion of the law. You have the conclusion of the prophets all wrapped up into the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who is now standing with the two of them as he knows them so personally. He's having a conversation with them. As he's talking with them about their, his departure, the literal word, Exodus, the leaving, as he still has to go to his death, which must be accomplished in Jerusalem. And it all happens. Finally, gets to wake up, comes heavy out of his sleep. And when he is fully awake with the rest, you know, the disciples are really good at sleeping when they're supposed to be praying. This isn't the first time this gets to happen. We see this later once again as Jesus takes him to the garden. Jesus is the one praying. They're the one sleeping. They've divided up the work. They come fully awake. And they've missed a lot already. But this is what they get to see. Jesus, and the glimpse of his glory. Two great men, Moses and Elijah, speaking with them. Also, humans that have just witnessed something incredible, they act much like humans again. And Peter, especially, kind of jumps to saying things he doesn't really know that he's saying. Master, uh, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tents, or let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. This will be great. We can all just stay up here. I'll serve you. John will serve you. James will serve you. It's going to stay. Or maybe this is just once again, God's going to communicate with us. You remember when Moses would go up to the mountain and he would be in the cloud and God would speak to him and he gave him the commandments and he came down. Moses was the one that delivered the word. Elijah was also the one that would deliver the word from God. This is how God's going to communicate with us. He's already... Uh, that immediate glory right now. And he's making this great proclamation. And he's, he's ready for, for this to be how it is. Let's just stay here. Let's just serve you, Jesus. Let's, just, let's keep Moses and Elijah here. We've wanted this for so long. Elijah was supposed to come back from back to the earth anyway by the prophet Micah. And then a cloud. How does that? Another thing that happens in the Old Testament, God in the cloud. Jesus covers his glory in the flesh. God covers himself in the cloud, and not just any cloud. This is a bright cloud. 
Verse 34 says this. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. You thought it was something magnificent to see who Jesus was, Moses and Elijah. Suddenly, when this cloud comes in, it's terror, it's fear. You really understand what the power of God feels. And out of this cloud, it says, a voice came, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Not Moses, not Elijah. This isn't just the man. This isn't just one leader. This is my son. And when the voice is spoken, Jesus was alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. If you look at the accounts again, it says Jesus gently touched them. You see, God is both power, and he's also the comfort. He can give fear, but he can gently. The two are one together. Power, majesty, glory, something so great it's terrifying. But he's also the gentle one. One that will go to the cross and die for these men. He told them not to say it until after his resurrection because this was just a glimpse. Just a glimpse of what it will be like on the other side of the resurrection is full glory. You see the true character of who God, who Jesus really is in the flesh, concealed just below. After this, the disciples are having trouble expelling a demon. A man comes to Jesus and says, My has he, he has an evil spirit in him. I brought him to your disciples, and they can't cast him out. What does Jesus say? Your faith is so weak. Your faith is so weak, you can't even accomplish this. Shouldn't there be no doubt for these three men that just witnessed what they had seen on this mountain? For instance, say, you are the Christ. And then they, they have some, they start backing up because he has to die. Then they see this glory. And then once again, it seems to back off. Jesus says, where is your faith? Don't you remember what you've seen among me? I firmly believe that these things were maybe suppressed in their mind. They weren't ready to fully understand it until after the resurrection, which is why Jesus told them not to speak of it until after the resurrection. Then they would understand it. In fact, Peter later says in his second epistle, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, he says this, Finally, when it comes full circle, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we were made known to you the power of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. This isn't something we made up. This isn't something that we got together and we had to put it all together and we made this big story and we started spreading it around. No, 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 no. This wasn't cleverly devised. But we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. This wasn't a vision or a shared dream. We were there. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majesty, glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. We were there. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, 
but men spoke from God as they carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were eyewitnesses. They understood the prophecy. They delivered it. You heard it. You've believed it. You know this story. And you know this wasn't something cleverly devised. What will you do with this story? What are you going to do knowing that the glory of God, his majesty, was concealed and he got to be with us on earth and he revealed it just a little bit and now you fully know how he reigns on the throne of God. What will you get to do with it? In the book of Acts, chapter 4. I love this chapter. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, Peter and John, now that the resurrection's over, they go on with the message that they know, sharing the message. And where does it land them? It lands them in the court of the Sadducees. They healed a man. The Sadducees bring him into the court, and they say, you've done something good, and you're taking the people away from us, and we're really annoyed by it. So all we can do is tell you not to speak in the name of Jesus. Just before that, actually, in verse 13, he calls them uneducated. He says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, in other words, they thought they were dumb, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. You know the message of Jesus. People should recognize that you know Jesus. And in fact, even when the court wants to say you've done something good, but we can't find anything in opposition to you. All they can do is say, don't speak of this name. And what do they say to that? Whether we should follow men or God, you decide. But we can't help but speak his name. This is what he's done for us. And in verse 23, it says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported to the chief priests and the elders what that seemed to them and what had been said. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointing. God, you know what's coming against you. You came in power. You came in glory. You concealed it. You were dead. You came back again. You gave us life and salvation. And still the earth plots against you. It says again in verse 27, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, and Pontius Pilate, we've seen them play out before, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan has predestined to take place. Now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak the word with all boldness. You know the word of Jesus. It's been revealed to you. Will you speak it with boldness? And verse 30 says this, while you stretch your hand, we'll speak with boldness, you stretch out your hands to heal. Not destroy. Not to remove the obstacle. Because we recognize the people are broken and they need your healing, God. We'll speak the word with boldness. God, you heal. Verse 31 is so at the place that they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Do you desire that boldness? Do you desire that boldness? Peter, James, John, 
they witness the glory of Jesus, just a glimpse of it on a mountaintop. And when they saw it, they were afraid. But Jesus comforted them, and now they pray for boldness. He grants boldness, he's gentle, but he also has power, and a fearful power. You know his glory. You read about it here. You know he holds those who are so precious to him in his hand. So personal was he with Moses and Elijah as he is with the men that have delivered this message all the way down so that we could know it and we are held in his hand. Easter is not the only day for us to remember Christ. It's not the only day for the world to think that they remember who Christ is, especially one that would display his glory just on a mountaintop for a moment. Every day is a day for boldness. And the same God that revealed that he sits on the throne beyond this life is the same God that has given us boldness to speak his name and the truth. If there is any doubt in your mind or if you have questions, about if God, if Christ is Jesus, there's opportunity to learn more. Or if you believe that, he's calling you to join him in salvation and the waters of baptism. And for the rest of this station, to be bold and to spread the message of Jesus Christ. I thank you for your time.